As you know, we have been in a, a series for uh, some time now uh, in the book of Ephesians, um, and our, our title is Blessed. We have been blessed uh, to be a blessing uh, wherever we might uh, go in this world. And uh, we last week began um, a, uh, a th- what, what, what was supposed to be a three-part um, um, a series on uh, unity, but may turn out to be a seven-part series. We'll see how it goes. Um, but um, as you know, uh, the book of Ephesians um, is, is aiming at something. Uh, it begins with worship, and it ends in warfare. Uh, and it's, that's instructive for us, is that if we're to fight the good fight, and finish uh, the race, and and finish our course, and keep the faith, uh, we have to be worshipers of the living God for what he has done in Christ by his spirit to redeem us, to bring us into his family, to bring us into his mission in this world. He, He has us in this world for a particular mission. We are here for a reason. Our lives are Uh, As many have said, they are on purpose. God saved us uh, not to sit, uh, but to serve him with the gifts that he has given to us. And so he instructs us in the way this letter is laid out chronologically that we begin with worshiping the living God and, and filling our vision with what he has done for our salvation by reminding ourselves, as chapter 2 says, of how we were once lost, but in Christ we are now found, and we have been loved, we have received the grace of God, and we have been given gifts to serve, so that, um, as it says in uh, chapter 2, um, uh, we have been made uh, by God to be uh, one new man. Um, there is not uh, simply, um, there used to be Uh, the human race was divided into Jews and into Gentiles. And that was, you either were in one of those camps. Uh, But since Christ has come, uh, there are, there's one new man now that is composed of all nations, Jews and all Gentiles, who trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ. And so we are called to function as one new man. In the book of Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says that Uh, He wants to hear about God's people that they stand firm with one spirit, with one mind, fighting side by side for the faith of the gospel. So the portrait that is given is of people who are on a mission. They all have the same mind, they all have the same motive, and they all have the same goal in mind. It's fighting for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they set their foot. And so... Uh, In this uh, uh, particular chapter of the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, we have been talking about how the first verse uh, says that we're we're called to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have been uh, called. And that is a summary verse for the rest of the letter. Uh, Chapter 4, verse uh, 2 to chapter 6, verse um, uh, 20, basically, is, is... an out, as outworking of what it means to walk in a worthy manner. And we talked about um, what that means primarily is walking in a way that Jesus walked, uh, walking uh, in a Christ-like way. And we have been discussing the importance of unity in the body of Christ and that we are to, as it says here, to be eagerly maintaining the unity that the Spirit has created in the bond of peace. And so uh, we, we also uh, mentioned, as you know, uh, the seven particular foundations on which unity rests. Uh, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And so the Trinity, uh, as you know, is a unity. God is one There's only one God, but he is in three distinct persons. And their own unity in the Trinity is the basis of and the foundation for our own unity in the body of Christ. 
And so as we are uh, devoted to the triune God, we are enabled uh, to uh, maintain uh, what God has established, uh, the unity that he has called us to. And so um, last week we spoke about one body and um, how we're called to be members of the same body. Uh, God has given each one of you gifts um, to minister uh, to the body of Christ. And um, no one in the body of Christ is ever allowed to say, I don't belong because I'm different. You are different on purpose. God made you different and made you distinct and gifted you specifically to function in the body of Christ. And so you belong in the body of Christ as a believer in Jesus. And by the same token, no one is allowed to say, I don't need you because you are different. Uh, we're not allowed to say these things. We, we are all necessary and we all belong. No matter what race or tribe or culture or language, when we trust in Jesus, we are plugged into, connected to the body of Jesus Christ, and we are a part of that organism. And so, so we are called, with the gifting that God has given us, to seek the common good of the church. We talked many weeks ago, and I'm repeating myself on purpose, to give your gifts away. God gave you gifts to serve the body of Christ to seek the common good. And um, so we are called to seek the well-being of the church. Uh, moreover, we are called to pursue, um, as you know, each person's maturity in the body of Christ. That is uh, why we're called to be eager to maintain unity, is so we would grow in maturity and grow in ministry and grow in uh, the mission of God. Um, so, so we are not called to sit, uh, we are called uh, to serve uh, the body of Jesus Christ. Um, one way to, to illustrate this is that if you sit for a long time, and probably everybody has experienced this before, but when you sit for a long period of time, uh, sometimes your leg can fall asleep on you. And uh, then some emergency happens and you have to get up quickly and get somewhere and you realize that you can't walk straight when your leg is asleep. You can't feel it and you walk funny and you try to run and you usually will fall over when your leg is asleep. And so the point of the illustration is, is that we're not called to sit and to sleep. In this same letter in chapter 5, Paul says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead and let Christ shine on you. Is that sometimes in the body of Christ we find that there Sometimes we're sleeping in the body of Christ. We're not serving with the gifts that God has given to us. And we can't grow up. We can't mature unless each part is doing their part. Each part is using their gifts to function so, as, so that we can be one man. Imagine if you're called to run a marathon, which is what the Christian life is. It is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And you can't run a marathon with a sleepy leg. If your leg is asleep, you can't do it. But, but when everyone is, is not simply sitting but serving the Lord, we're able as one body, one man, to run the race and complete the race that God has given to us. And so we talked about one, one, one body, and, and this morning I want to talk about one spirit and, and possibly um, one hope. Um, one spirit, uh, that phrase, one spirit, comes earlier in this particular letter in Ephesians chapter 2, if you look at verse 18, it says, For through him, through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And so uh, one of the chief things that's being talked about in Ephesians chapter 4 with one spirit is the access that we have to God as the people of God to pray to God. And, and you've been around church for some time. One of the first things that always goes in the church is the prayer meeting. People just don't want to come to prayer meeting unless you kind of have to make them or, 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 or twist their arms sometimes. And, and prayer is, is our way to the presence of God. It's our access to the throne of God, to the headquarters of God. 
It's the way we appeal to God. And, and without uh, prayer, uh, we are weak and we are powerless. Uh, but when we call on the name of the Lord, remember uh, what we said last week uh, the, the, when the Lord said to his people of old, he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear in heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal the land. And so when we look out into the culture today and we see so much wrong with the world that we're living in, we have to first look in the mirror as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, as those who have access to the throne room of God, to the power center of the universe, to the, to the omnipotent God, the omniscient, omniscient the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the all-wise God. Uh, we have access. We're the only ones who have access to God through Jesus Christ, by the Spirit. And so, so, so the, 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 the calling, the believer who calls and cries out to God, you have uh, access to the one who will shape and reshape and transform culture. Uh, many times, uh, big changes, cultural changes have taken place uh, in the world because God's people have prayed to him and they have repented of their own sin and have called upon the name of the Lord. And so prayer is primary. It's essential. You can't live the Christian life without praying to God. And so we have dedicated at our church uh, every first Sunday uh, in the EM, we want to meet for prayer uh, at 9.30 and, and to call upon the name of the Lord and seek his face and his purposes so that his, his will might be done. Uh, how often uh, do you pray in your own life? Um, is prayer uh, something that is um, uh, just panic for you, that when you panic you pray? Or is prayer something that's a daily uh, discipline, a daily joy, a daily delight to get into your Father's presence and call upon his name and seek his purposes and seek his pleasures and call upon him to do his, to do his will uh, in this world. Uh, the Bible says that uh, Jesus Christ always lives to intercede for us. He never stops praying for us. And that, that the Bible says we don't know how to pray, really. We don't know what to say to God, really. And so God has given us his Holy Spirit who, who intercedes for us with groans that are too deep for words according to the will of God. And therein is the key, the will of God. The will of God is his word, what he has communicated to us. And we have one of the, we have the best prayer book of all in the book of Psalms. Every single one of those Psalms is not only praise, but it's prayer to God. If you ever wonder, what should I say to God? How should I approach God? Open up the book of Psalms and pray those prayers back to God. If you read carefully, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's a, it's a time when, when, when David was wanting to build a house for the Lord. He had built a, a house of cedar for himself and he, 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 he had in his mind to build a house for the Lord and he talked to Nathan the prophet. And so Nathan told him, well, go do everything that, that God has put in your heart to do. And, and then when Nathan went uh, to sleep, uh, at that same night, God came to Nathan and said, it's not for David to build a house, uh, but, but God promised uh, David that he would build him a house. He would, he would give him an offspring who would always sit on his throne, and he would give him a name and, and would, would always have one of his offspring uh, to lead the kingdom. And so Nathan went back and told that message to David. And it's interesting how David responds. He takes the very words that Nathan got from God and he flips them and prays them right back to God. God makes a promise, he turns it into prayer and prays the promise back to God. And that's how we're instructed in scripture to pray, to pray the promises back to God. Our prayer begins with God's word to us and God's word uh, for us. And uh, uh, the Bible uh, says, if you turn, for example, to... Um, uh, the, the gospel according to John, um, 
the Gospel according to John, chapter 14, uh, the Lord uh, says, um, in, in verse 12, He says, uh, John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in Me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will He do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in My name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And um, sometimes we often uh, use this passage as a blank check, but we have to read carefully what Jesus is saying. He's saying that, that um, whoever believes will do the works that I do. And so our prayers are supposed to be related to doing the things that Jesus did. Pursuing salvation, pursuing restoration, pursuing reconciliation. Those are the works that we're supposed to give ourselves to. And then he says, greater works than these will you do. And he says, whatever you ask in my name. And so sometimes this passage is abused to mean just pray for whatever you want and just put the name of Jesus on it and it'll be yours. But obviously that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying to ask for things that support uh, what his name stands for. His name is Jesus. It means salvation. His name is Christ. He's the prophet, the priest, and the king. His name is Lord. And so we should be asking for things uh, that promote that name of Jesus. We should be asking for things that, that show He is Lord and show that He is the Christ and show that He is the Savior. And so we should be pursuing the mission of God in our prayer life. That is what Jesus is after. And then He goes on to say how He's going to give them another comforter, the Spirit of truth, who will be with them uh, forever. And uh, the Spirit will guide them into all truth. Uh, he will not leave them as orphans. He will come to them. And so, when you turn over to John 15, uh, for example, in verse 26, it says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. But Jesus is talking specifically to his disciples at this time, but the principle is true of us as well. God has given us the Spirit, and we're called to bear witness about Jesus Christ. And so that should be what the one Spirit leads us to cry out to God for, is that we as a people would be people who bear witness about Jesus Christ, who bring glory to Jesus Christ, as he says in, in John 16, verse 14. The Spirit will not come to testify about himself, he will come to testify about me, Jesus says. He will come and give glory to me. And so in our prayer life, in our daily prayer life, is it simply, is our prayer life simply taken up with, oh God bless this and bless that and bless this and help me with this and help me with that? Or are we, are we subjecting our prayer life, the access that the Spirit has given to us, to the throne room of God? To the most powerful being in the universe. We have access, and are we using that access in a way that is related to and agreeable to the will of God and the purposes of God? Or are we using our prayer life simply for God to do our agenda? We've got agenda items. We've got stuff we want to do in life. We've got things we want God to bless. But are we first taking the step and saying, well, God, what is your agenda? What is your purpose? Why am I existing? And I want to cry out to you on behalf of your purposes and your will. Because that's what salvation is. Before we were saved, it was all about us and our life and our desires and our will. But when we met Jesus Christ, you know that we, we had a revelation through the Spirit. It was not about us. Life has never been about us. It's always about the will of God and worship for God and the ways of God. And so uh, we're called to, to live a life of prayer, a life of access, and to do it as, as a people of God. Um, it's one thing to pray 
uh, by yourself, and we should do that. The Bible teaches private prayer, but it also teaches corporate prayer, that we as a people enter into the presence of God on behalf of the purposes of God, knowing that when you seek first the kingdom of God and seek first the righteousness of God, everything else that you need in life will be provided for. You don't have to worry about anything or be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so we are called to be a people on mission with God, pursuing God's kingdom, His reign in our own life, His reign in this world and in the culture we live, and seeking righteousness and justice and mercy in this world. That is what it means for us as a people to pursue the living God and to use the access that the Spirit has given to us in a proper way. And so uh, the third thing is that we're, we have one hope, it says in the book of, of, of Ephesians. Uh, we've been given one hope. And you know that that hope is experiencing salvation in fullness. It's experiencing life without, without a stain and without blame and without shame and without guilt. It's experiencing life without death and without sickness and without hardship. It's the new heaven and the new earth. It's, 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 it's perfect righteousness. It's, it's being in communion with God. It's, it's Emmanuel. It's, it's being with Jesus and with God the Father, with the Spirit throughout all eternity in, in, a, in a new heaven and a new earth where, where there is no temptation, there is no fall. Everything is perfect and everything is flawless and everything is beautiful. It's, it's being in glory it's being glorified in the likeness of Jesus Christ, and it's glorifying Jesus Christ and, and, and the Father and the Spirit. And so, so that's our hope, and it is a certain hope. It is not some pie in the sky. This is going to happen. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And so that guarantees that, that when you get put in the box and get put in the ground, you're going to come out of the box. You don't have to live in the box. You know that. Are you tired of living in the box? You can get out of the box. Jesus has been risen uh, from the dead. And so our, our future is super bright. It's super bright. And so, so we are called, uh, often in the Bible, uh, John uh, Martin Luther uh, at one time said uh, that there are two days. There, are, there is this day and there is that day, the day when, he, when, when Christ comes and judgment comes and he's vindicated before the tribunal of the living God and ushered into uh, the new heaven and the new earth where he has infinite and eternal fellowship with the living God. And it's, it's, it's that day, the day of eternity, that leads us to live this day in appropriate ways. That's what hope is. Uh, someone one time illustrated it by saying this, that when you get ready for a picnic, uh, you're, you're envisioning the picnic. You're envisioning sitting on the, uh, the, the, um, the quilt and opening up your basket and, and eating fruit and sandwiches and enjoying the fellowship of people. That's your vision, a picnic. But because you, you hope for that picnic, because you're looking forward to that picnic, how do you function in the present? Well, you go to the supermarket, you buy the fruit, you make the sandwiches, you prepare the quilt. You're preparing yourself for the future. And so to, to, to have hope is that you live in light of the future. It's just like we've had all of this snow. Uh, when you hear that a storm is coming, you don't sit there and say, well, that's nice. No, you go uh, like everybody else. They lose their mind when, when they announce snow and they all run to the supermarket because their refrigerator has disappeared. And they buy all of the food in the, in the, in the supermarket because they, they only were there just yesterday, but they heard now that it's snowing, so they've got to go back again. You go to Home Depot and you go early in the morning so you can get the salt before the salt trucks come and take a whole skid of salt out of there. And you get the shovel and you sit and you wait. You prepared yourself. You've acted in the present in light of the future. You are headed for glory. You are headed for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells, where none but the righteous can get there. Uh, someone one time said, well, how many Presbyterians will be in heaven? There won't be any in heaven. How many, how many Baptists will be in heaven? There won't be any 
Well, who will be there? None but the righteous. None but the righteous get to heaven. It's not the denomination that you're a part of. It's, it's, the, it's the family of God. And so, so it's, it's preparing for the future. In, in um, 2, Peter, um, 2 Peter chapter 3, it says uh, in chapter 3, uh, verse, um, verse 10, it says, uh, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Then he says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, that's the future, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness in the present? Because God says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so every single hardship we experience in life, uh, the Bible says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you like sons. And, and basically God's message in the midst of our hardship, God is saying, I want you to be with me in glory forever. That's what this is about. Why are you having a hard day? It's about discipline. It's about sharing in the holiness of God. It's about His character being shaped in you. It's about God putting out a work order on you. He's saying, I've got a project to finish and complete you. I want you in glory. My son has prepared a mansion for you, but you can't get there without holiness in a daily life. And so that's what this hardship is about. It's about me shaping you and making you the people I want you to be. So be thankful, be praising God, and be obedient. The Bible goes on to say, uh, we're waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God uh, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We're waiting. It's the future. It hasn't happened yet. We're waiting for a new heaven and a new earth and then in verse 14, the next verse, it says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish, and at peace, and count the patience of the Lord salvation. And so he goes on to talk about how we're called to live lives of obedience, not to be saved, but obedience because we have been saved. And obedience is the only appropriate way for saved people to function. And so we're called to persevere in holiness, persevere in godliness, persevere in following Jesus Christ so that when he shows up, we might receive him in peace and the shalom, the well-being of the Lord will rest on us and we will be completely restored to the likeness of his image. And so there is a storm coming. Judgment day is approaching. Uh, the question is, that's the future. What are you doing about the future in the present? Are you prepared to meet God in perfect peace? Do you know without a shadow, without a doubt, that if I die today, it's okay with me. I'm going straight up to glory to be with Christ Jesus. Can you say that with assurance and the full assurance, not because you've been a good boy or you've been a good girl, but because there's a good God who has sent his son Jesus to die for your sin and to provide for you perfect righteousness, to meet God in perfect peace, and you have said to God, I need that righteousness. I need my sins bathed in the blood of Jesus. I need to be right with you, and so I come. The only offering I bring to you is the cross of Christ Jesus. I don't come with good works to bring to you. I don't come with money to bring to you. I come with the blood of Jesus Christ, and because of this blood, God, I'm asking for acceptance, for welcome, for rest, restoration into your family and into your eternal kingdom. Is that true of you? There's a storm coming, and are you ready? Do you have yourself prepared to meet that storm of judgment? And there's also salvation coming, and are you prepared to meet your Savior, your, your spiritual bridegroom? Who Are you prepared to meet him in perfect peace, or are you in a state of hiding from him? You know, you see sometimes lovers on the beach and they're married and they're running towards one another and they're just so overjoyed to be in each other's arms. 
well, well, Christ is your bridegroom and you are his bride. And are you like the one who's got his, got his hand on the doorknob waiting with bated breath for the bridegroom to open the door and you're ready to receive him without shame on your face? Is that true of me? Is it true of you? Well, the way we, we, we get right, you know, we, we repent of our sin. We return to our Savior. We live for him. Don't sit for the Savior. Serve the Savior. He's gifted you for ministry. Now serve him today. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father, in Christ's name, we, we give you thanks for uh, putting us in one body, the body of Christ, the one new man, the bride of your Son. Thank you, Lord, that you have sealed us by your one spirit in this family, and we will never be cast away. You have saved us with an everlasting salvation. You have loved us with an everlasting love. And Father, thank you for the certain hope that you give us of being with you in glory forevermore and never being cast out of your sight, but enjoying your presence in which there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Thank you for this hope, Father. Fill our hearts with it, and in light of it, in light of it help us to live each day in the present for your glory, for your praise, for your worship, responding to you and responding to your grace with obedient lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.